As anyone will tell you, and probably already has, no one gets out of this life alive. There's one thing certain in life other than taxes. Every creature on this planet has an expiration date. It's the nature of biology. But is that it? Does our existence just come to a halt? Does everything we are simply stop with our death? Many cultures, not to mention many individuals, think there could be more, that after we expire, our beings are transported to another plane of existence, either higher or lower. The question of what happens after we die has rattled us since we first contemplated mortality. So if there is evidence of existence after death, that would be important news. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and we devote one episode a month to critical thinking, skeptic check. The idea of an afterlife is profound, but what is the evidence for life beyond death? There is a genre of literature made up of first-hand accounts of near-death experiences in which a person visits heaven and returns. Now, some say these stories are proof of life after death, but do they meet the standard of good science? We'll look at the evidence and also examine other out-of-body experiences and whether there's a neurological explanation for them all. It's Skeptic Check after the hereafter on Big Picture Science. know for certain about a young boy named Alex Malarkey is both compelling and tragic. When he was six years old, Alex and his father were in an auto accident in which Alex was nearly killed and was left permanently paralyzed. What happened next is less certain. After he came out of a coma, Alex claimed to have made many trips to heaven and back. Over the next six years, he and his father Kevin wrote a book about the experience, The Boy Who Came Back From Heaven. Since 2010, it has sold more than a million copies and was on the New York Times bestseller list for five years. It was soon joined by another similar bestseller, one written by Todd Burpo, the father of a four-year-old son, Colton, who said his son had visited heaven while anesthetized for an emergency appendectomy. The young boy claimed that he wore a halo and wings and sat on the lap of Jesus. His father's account of his son's experience has also sold millions. Heaven is for real a little boy's astounding story of his trip to heaven and back. A film based on the book was released in 2014. The books are just two among many that claim to provide eyewitness accounts of the hereafter. In fact, one reviewer said that they're being published so fast it's impossible to review them all. But not everyone who is a believer in the afterlife welcomes the narratives. The blogger Tim Challies, a pastor in Canada, has dismissed them as heaven tourism, which he describes as a whole new and regrettable genre of Christian fiction. Except that they're shelved as nonfiction. So let's take these two cases, young boys claiming to have possible evidence of the afterlife. That would be big news if true. But now there's a twist. One of the boys has retracted his story. Writing for Discovery News, Ben Radford, deputy editor of the Skeptical Inquirer, described how in January 2015, Alex Malarkey took back his account of a heavenly visitation. Ben, a young boy, Alex Malarkey, and yes, that really is his name, had a life-changing experience in 2004. Tell me about that. Yes, it was a fascinating story. I, in, in 2004, this six-year-old boy named Alex Malarkey was involved in a, a horrific car accident along with his father. And the impact of the crash paralyzed young Alex, and they were wondering whether he was ever going to live again, much less walk again or anything else. And when he finally emerged from a coma, he came back with a fascinating story of having visited heaven and seen angels. So he was how old again? Six years old. Six years old, and he had gone to see heaven. Now, was he saying this on his hospital bed? I mean, was this immediately upon regaining consciousness? Well, uh, he was in the coma for two months, and soon after, it wasn't immediately after he came back, he said, wow, oh my God, I've had these experiences. It took some time. He was working with his father, Kevin Malarkey, and the two of them together wrote this best-selling 2010 book called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. So it took them six years to put together this book. 
Yeah, that, that does seem odd, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I believe the claim was that the memories came back to him slowly. It wasn't like he just sort of sat down and spewed all this out. And so clearly there was a process of collaboration between young Alex Malarkey and his father in writing this book, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. All right. Well, give me a synopsis. I mean, here, modern medicine gives this kid who is not even expected to live, much less tell, uh, gives him a return ticket from heaven, apparently. How did he describe heaven? What, what was it like? Well, it was it was interesting. I mean, he uh, he, he talked about meeting angels and, and loved ones and the gates of heaven. It was just this fascinating book that had these. It, it was actually very similar to essentially Christian theology. That was it was borrowed very heavily from Christian themes: uh, forgiveness, love, redemption, guardian angels, things like that. Did, did he describe the landscape? I always wonder about that. In the cartoons, it's always kind of cloudy on the ground. But I, I, I sort of wonder what what he said. Well, it, it's uh, you know. Most of the book isn't so much about heaven, it's about his personal experience. And so he doesn't devote that much of the time to actually describing the sights and sounds of, of the hereafter. Most of it's about his personal journey and in how his experiences bolstered his Christian faith and, of course, that of his family. How did the media react to this? His book comes out in 2010. Uh, you know, his visit to heaven, did they pay any attention to it? Did they pay a lot of attention to it? People loved it. <laughs> this was exactly what a Christian audience was looking for. And it's fascinating because there's actually a whole series of books on these lines. It's actually a sort of subgenre of Christian literature and publishing. So even though uh, Malarkey's was only the most recent story, there were several others. In fact, there was a book that came out just a few years later, titled Heaven is for Real. It was, it was actually a sort of very similar story by a young boy named Colton Burpo. And so what you have in these and other similar stories are where you have a young person who experiences some sort of horrific trauma, typically brain trauma, and then they report having come back with a new appreciation of their spirituality, and particularly Christian spirituality, curiously enough, and talking about the importance of heaven and believing and things like that. He's a young boy, and apparently this other kid, Colton Burpo, also a young boy, they're the ones that go to heaven. Presumably the assumption, the underlying thrust of this is that, you know, young people are not going to lie. They're still pretty innocent, and of course they're going to go to heaven if they suffer trauma early in life. But were the media actually uncritical about this? I mean, you know, kids at that age also believe in Santa Claus. Right. No, you bring up a good point. And uh, certainly initially, there was very little skepticism about these stories. You have to remember that the audience for these stories was the general public and Christians who want their faith bolstered by these supposed true life stories that reinforce their pre-existing narratives and beliefs. So there was actually relatively little uh, skepticism at, at the time. Uh, this sounds a bit crass, but did they profit the, the son and the father from this? I mean, did... Uh... Uh, presumably they got some media attention beyond the write-ups, uh, the reviews of the books, but uh, maybe they were on television or radio, or they, they got some royalties. What, yeah. was, what was in it for them from that commercial point of view? Well, I haven't seen their checkbooks, so I, I don't know. <laughs> they haven't disclosed exactly how much they made from the books. Uh, many of these books are bestsellers. In fact, 90 Minutes in Heaven, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, Colton Burpo's book, Heaven is Real, all these were New York Times bestsellers. So these books are being sold hand over fist. Ben, how much of the book do you think was actually written by Alex Malarkey? Because after all, he was a young kid. That's a great question. You know, you have to remember, he was, this is a six-year-old kid who had just emerged from a two-month coma. So, you know, it's not clear how much of the story came from Alex and how much it was encouraged by his father, Kevin. If you look on the cover of the book, Kevin is actually the, the main author and Alex is, is the second author. My guess is that Alex Malarkey was sort of encouraged into it or goaded into it. I don't want to say he was manipulated because I don't know, but probably both of them recognized that there was a market and probably a desire to have an inspiring Christian story for Christian audiences and the general public as well. Okay. Well, there's been a twist in this story, and you've covered this uh, recently in an article. Uh, Alex Malarkey has uh, changed his story. W what's he claiming now? He did, yeah. To his credit, Alex Malarkey uh, said, I lied. He had admitted that he did not, in fact, visit heaven and that his entire book was fictional. He said, quote, please forgive my brevity, but because of my physical limitations, I have to keep this short. I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible, end quote.
And, and <laughs> what, what motivated this? I mean, you know, as you say, it's admirable to be candid, although you could say, but why wasn't he candid in the first place? I mean, what, what changed? Well, it's interesting. Uh, when, when this story first came out that Malarkey had recanted his book, there were lots of people going back and forth and trying to figure out how, you know, is this a real recantation? Is this under duress? Is he under medication? What's going on here? And in fact, it's interesting because Malarkey remains a staunch Christian. In his statement clarifying the matter, he specifically says that his Christian faith compelled him to clear the air about this and to come forward with it and admit that his best-selling book was not real and was a hoax, that all these people who had made him this this sort of hero of the story and this young boy who, who you know visited angels and God and, and came back and all that, that uh, it, it wasn't true. And so, but, you know, I have to say it, it takes some integrity to come forward even years later and say, you know what, the book that I'm well known for, the reason I'm known at all, was not true. What about the publisher of the book? That couldn't have been a good day. No, I imagine that was a very awkward day at Tyndale House uh, Lifeway, the publisher. They announced they would stop selling the book. Of course, by this time, it had been a bestseller and had brought them certainly millions of dollars. And so, uh, so the fact that they're suddenly retiring the book, I'm sure, didn't bite too much into their, their bottom line. And the fact is that any time the public sees a book or a movie or anything else being claimed to be based on a true story, certainly if it involves paranormal, life after death, ghosts, exorcisms, whatever else, they should be skeptical. You know, the reason that the Burpo's book and Malarkey's book, both of them were, were so popular, was you have a young person, as you pointed out, presumably innocent young kid, you know, six years old, 10, you know, in the case of Burpo, whatever else, you know, the assumption is they have no reason to lie. They're relating their, their true stories. And so they drew from pre-existing Christian narratives. When Malarkey described heaven, he didn't describe it in some sort of outlandish way, you know, of ice cream trucks and Disneyland. He described it in a Christian context, and that made it palatable and believable to many people. Ben, what would it take for you to believe that someone had real data on the afterlife? Well, you know, as a skeptic, I need good evidence. I mean, these sorts of stories, as interesting as they are, they're anecdotes. They're, a, you know, one person's firsthand experience. This is what they're claiming. So the fact is that if you look at the narratives that are out there, there's actually quite a bit of differences. For example, there are some people who claim to have gone to heaven who, like Malarkey, were the victims of, of head trauma. And so they experienced brain trauma. And during their coma, during their unconsciousness, these are the experiences they reported. In other cases, you have people like the late Sylvia Brown, who wrote several books on the afterlife. The, she's a psychic. And she claimed uh, through her spirit guides and her psychic abilities to have visited heaven, this and that. So one of the things that would compel me, that I would find compelling, was if these narratives were more consistent. That is, if you had people from different cultures and different beliefs that were describing heaven in the same way, that might be interesting. If I'm a believer in the afterlife, and I think that this is for real, what would I cite then as the best evidence? I mean, there's belief, of course, but and there were these books. What's the best evidence? Well, unfortunately, there there is no best evidence. I, I wish there was. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the subject of near-death experiences and ghosts and the afterlife, as many people are. And I would love to find good quality evidence. The problem is that it's simply not there. There have been many books written by Ian Stevenson and others that have claimed to look at past lives and claim to say, for example, that you know, reincarnation that a person will claim to remember living 200 years ago in a different country or whatever else. And on the surface, many of those claims sound compelling, but when you get below the surface and you start really closely examining what exactly the claims are, then in fact you find that many of these claims fall apart under scrutiny. The evidence just simply isn't there. I also want to add that while, you know, Alex Malarkey and Colton Burpo, part of the reason that their books were bestsellers was because of who they were, young kids who experienced brain trauma, injury, whatever else, and came back from heaven and had these remarkable stories. But there's also many other books that were written uh, by adults who claim essentially the same thing. For example, there was a, a physician named Eben Alexander who wrote a book called Proof of Heaven, even actually made the cover of Newsweek in October 2012. And he had this best-selling book about how he was a neurosurgeon and had all those experiences. 
However, later on, a uh, investigation by an Esquire writer named uh, Luke Dittrich questioned his claims about whether he was, in fact, unconscious at the time that Alexander claimed that he was going through these experiences. This is part of a, a much broader interest in you know book subgenre. Ben Radford, thanks so very much for talking to me today. Thanks. Great to be on. Ben Radford is a paranormal investigator, a research fellow at the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, and deputy editor of The Skeptical Inquirer. A link to his Discovery News article describing the case of Alex Malarkey is on our website, bigpicturescience.org. Well, one thing that must be noted in this story is that even if Alex Malarkey did recant his story, that is not proof that heaven doesn't exist. Yes, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence indeed. But what is the evidence? Well, according to Ben, it's uh, anecdotal. You know, it's it's the testimony of people who claim that they've been to the other side. Now, you know, that's not very good evidence in science. It's, why, why not? If people have witnessed an event, why isn't that evidence that the event occurred? Well, for a scientist, that's always subject to, you know, interpretation. What you see and what you remember those aren't very reliable. I mean, consider criminal cases, right? You get 10 people who witness a crime and they can't agree even among themselves, even though they were all there. So that's not so good. If you have something that you can measure, something you can take to the lab, that's, you know, more of a gold standard for science. So that's what he was saying. It's also interesting that both boys described heaven in terms that are recognizable to most of us, angels and harps and so forth, which presumably are descriptions of heaven found in the Bible. Well, maybe not, says a theologian. And he says, whether or not the books prove the existence of heaven, the belief in an afterlife has profound consequences for how we live our lives. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check, After the Hereafter. Support for Big Picture Science comes from Google. The Making and Science team at Google aims to inspire the next generation of scientists and makers by helping them develop a deeper understanding of the world around them. Learn more at makingscience.withgoogle.com. One thing is certain. These books that describe a heavenly trip, if you will, are best sellers. Millions of people have bought them. But why? Why is the concept of an afterlife so compelling? Ben Radford said that one reason that the books are popular is because Christians want their belief bolstered by these narratives. However, Greg Garrett, a professor of English at Baylor University who writes on culture and religion, says you can't make a sweeping statement about the appeal of these books to Christians. The books don't appeal to all. Some find the eyewitness accounts of heaven an affront to their faith. But if the books are compelling, it may be because the idea of heaven has been woven into our culture as well as our religions for ages, says Dr. Garrett. The author of many books, his most recent is Entertaining Judgment, the Afterlife in Popular Imagination. And while the images of heaven found in the Malarkey and Burpo accounts may be drawn from pre-existing Christian narratives, according to Ben, they're not necessarily drawn from the Bible, says Dr. Garrett. The traditional image of heaven comes from many popular cultural sources, but irrespective of whether the books are good evidence of the afterlife or not, that fact is unlikely to sway the faith of those who believe that there is a place we go after this one. And the debate over heaven matters, he says, because whether you believe in the next life has consequences for this one. Greg, there is this assumption that the popular image of heaven and angels, all of that comes from the Bible, but apparently it doesn't. Well, it sort of depends on how you read the Bible. And uh, so one of the things that led me to write this book, Entertaining Judgment, was um, a statement from one of the great New Testament scholars, N.T. Wright, who said, you know, there's not actually a whole lot in the Bible about going to heaven when you die. And when I started thinking about that, I thought, you know, actually, that's really true. The concept of heaven, as far back as we can go in the human record, uh, when we find people telling stories, we find them trying to figure out what it is that happens to people after they die. Uh, in the Greek epics, we find, you know, some references to the afterlife. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, we don't find an awful lot about heaven until we get up close to the Christian era. There is not much of a concept of the afterlife in the Jewish Testament. 
the Hebrew Testament, there is some development of that idea in the sort of intertestamental years. And then by the time we get to the Christian era, there's sort of this very well-developed idea that if there's going to be justice in the universe, that probably some of it is going to have to take place after we die, because it's pretty clear that it's not happening while we're alive. And so in some ways we can say that the, the concept of heaven, at least as we understand it in the West, is a relatively recent phenomenon. And then the, the different ways that we've thought about heaven have been developed at least as much through our art and culture as they are through any sort of scriptural record. Let, let me follow up a little bit on that, though, because, you know, what you're saying is that the idea of heaven, at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition, is, you know, thousands of years old, but not tens of thousands of years old. And yet, uh, I can't help but note that it seems that almost every culture, right, whether they're, you know, Western cultures or any other culture, many of them have this idea of an afterlife. I mean, this seems to be sort of baked into our being. Yeah, I think there is this very definite idea that there is something that happens after we die. So it is something that does seem to be sort of hardwired into us. And even though there are plenty of people who sort of, you know, skeptically say, well, I don't believe in an afterlife, we consume all these stories of the afterlife over and over again in our pop culture. Well, you mentioned the influence of our culture in shaping our perception of what the afterlife might be. And you've talked about fluffy cloud heaven, fluffy cloud heaven. I mean, if you ask, you know, the guy on the street to give his impression of what heaven is like, it's probably, you know, from a New Yorker cartoon showing clouds lying around and people with wings walking about in robes. Yeah, people with wings plucking harps. There is that sort of stereotypical and maybe even sort of sentimentalized idea of heaven as this place of clouds and, and uh, sort of human beings turned into angels, which is kind of a cross-species thing theologically, but that's still sort of the vision that we have. We've heard in this show about uh, books written by two young boys, Alex Malarkey, a, a book co-authored with his father, mm -hmm. and, and Todd Burpo, and we also heard that Malarkey has recently recanted his story of having been in heaven. But both boys claim that they have made, if you will, a round trip to heaven. Yeah, a round trip. Yes. Now, you've written that reactions have varied widely to this news. What was it that you found significant here? Well, it's a, it's such an interesting genre. And, of course, it's something that goes way, way back. We got all sorts of reports from people, you know, purporting to have gone to heaven or to hell or to purgatory. And so, you know, Dante is, is one of those people, you know, in his, uh, his trilogy of, of uh, great epic poems is doing that sort of spiritual tourism that uh, these boys claim to have done in their books and written about. But it's so interesting because both of these books were bestsellers. They were appealing to a lot of people who wanted some sort of, I don't know if you would call it factual, empirical proof that heaven is for real, you know, to sort of quote the, the title of the book by the Burpos. But there is, I think, a real segment of the, the population that wants to have their faith confirmed in some way which feels a little less like faith and more like fact to me. But it sounds like the attraction is indeed, uh, and, and perhaps this is a consequence of the kind of technological age we live in in which science is so important, is the replacement of belief with data, or if not replacement, at least the supplement of belief with data that apparently appeals to our contemporaries. Uh, Seth, I think that's such a, an important idea. I think post-enlightenment Christianity is often really strongly affected by that desire to prove something empirically. Uh, starting in the 19th century, for example, we get this wave of biblical archaeology, people who want to go out and prove that all these sites written about in the Bible and the sites of the, the biblical miracles are actual places. You know, we want to find Noah's Ark. We want to find the Ark of the Covenant. We want to verify that these things that we have been approaching through the eyes, this lens of faith, are things that are actual provable things. You know, you could say that if, if you're not uh, someone who believes in an afterlife, that all of this is you know, like angels on the head of a pin kind of stuff. It's not important. It doesn't affect anything. But you've written that the stories we tell each other about the afterlife are important in terms of how we live our lives. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, and just, you know, taking it from the yes or no standpoint, and of course there may be people who are somewhere in the middle. Maybe there's an afterlife, maybe there isn't. 
you know, if you're a person who is living in the story that there is no afterlife, that you only go around once in this life, and uh, so this is this is that one occurrence, then you're going to organize your life differently than if you imagine that there is something that comes after this. And then correspondingly, if you're a person who is trying to attain that afterlife, and particularly if that's an afterlife that you attain by living in a certain way and, and expressing your faith and your belief in a certain way, then you're going to shape your life in that way. I was raised in, in the latter tradition. Uh, I was raised in a very conservative Christian tradition in which everything was about going to heaven when you die. And so your everyday life was oriented around doing the things that would keep you out of hell, get you into heaven. So that, I think, is, is why we can say that what we believe about the afterlife, even if we believe there is no afterlife, shapes the way that we experience and, and live out our lives day to day. The books that Alex Malarkey and Todd Burpo wrote of having visited the afterlife are controversial, and not just amongst those who you know, don't believe in an afterlife. They're, they're controversial among some Christians as well. Why are they controversial? Oh, that is really an interesting thing. Um, you can understand why people who are skeptical about heaven would be fairly cynical about books like this, particularly books like this that sell a ton of, of uh, copies and uh, get made into feature films and things like that. But from the other side, from the Christian side, there are people who say, you know, this is an attempt to sort of be extra biblical. Uh, to step outside the canon and to say that we are going to verify God's moving in the cosmos through these these books and not through the biblical text. And of course, that comes back to one of the opening questions we talked about, which is how much is there actually in the Bible about heaven? And um, for me and for a lot of uh, people sort of uh, who read the Bible as, as I do, there is not an awful lot. But if you are of this persuasion that, uh, you know, every time the word heaven gets mentioned, for example, in the New Testament, it must be about this place where you go to live with God when you die, then you're content. You don't need to add to the, the canon, so to speak, with, with one of these books written by somebody who could have ulterior motives. And so the way that people, these Christian leaders have responded to these books was simply to say, I don't think we need them, and I don't think that uh, people should be consuming them, looking for proof, because we've got all the proof we need in the Holy Scriptures. And the fact that, at least in one case, in the case of Alex Malarkey, you know, it was, it was in a way kind of a misrepresentation. I mean, he'd simply lied by saying that he had seen heaven and came back, and so that, you know, that might be seen as something manipulative and consequently, you know, not helpful. I mean, yeah. I suppose there's just that. Yeah, it's just one of those things where, uh, I, I mean, I'd guess the same thing is true in, in science, you know, that bad science or pseudoscience can in some ways be tremendously harmful to the cause of science in the same way that, that bad faith or pseudo faith could be harmful to the, the cause of genuine faith. Finally, Greg. Obviously, the appeal of an afterlife, I mean, well, that is obvious. Everybody can understand why you'd want to know if it's true. But let me ask you this. If somehow, this is very theoretical, but if somehow you could prove, well, there actually isn't an afterlife, how do you think that would affect religion? Would it affect it at all? Or could, you know, could religion live without an afterlife? Seth, I think that for some people, it would kill their faith. If you are a person who is sort of largely built your faith, and that's not just, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian, it's also Islam, it's also in some other traditions, wisdom traditions, the idea that, you know, the, the choices that you make in this life are going to affect where you go or what you come back as. I think for some people it would be absolutely faith-killing. For me personally, and, and I hope for a lot of other people, it wouldn't, because my faith, my own personal faith, makes my life better day to day. And if I should end up in a wonderful place, whatever that might be after my life is over, in some ways it's almost frosting, you know, on top of the cupcake. Because my life is a great cupcake right now. And so if that is all that your faith is about, then I could see why this would be a, a question that would bounce you out of any sort of ongoing, continuing faith. But for people who also think that, you know, faith is about uh, an ethical system, it's about a, a way of being and a way of being in the world, then I think for people like that, it would be, well, that's too bad, but I'm going to get up today and I'm going to do the stuff that I'm going to do. 
and tomorrow I'll get up and do the same thing. And, and I hope that that uh, would be something that a lot of people could say that they could embrace for the rest of whatever time remains to them. Greg Garrett, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Oh, my pleasure, Seth. Greg Garrett is a professor of English at Baylor University. He writes about books, culture, and religion for the Huffington Post and is the author of many books, including Entertaining Judgment, The Afterlife in Popular Imagination. So what we're hearing in the show is that science cannot prove that there is an afterlife at this point or disprove the idea of an afterlife. But for those who are religious and devout, that doesn't matter. As Dr. Garrett says, the faithful have all the proof that they need. And so the scientific inquiry as to whether or not heaven exists is separate from that, from the religious belief that it does. That reminds me of what Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary biologist, said about science and religion. He said, look, they're separate magisteria. In other words, you know, they're separate domains. And science can't prove or disprove the tenets of faith. Otherwise, I suppose you probably wouldn't call it faith. But whether or not you believe in the existence of the afterlife, you have to say that our investigation of it is because it's important. Because for those who believe that it's there or those who don't believe it's there, it affects our lives. So it is important. Not all out-of-body experiences include a visit to heaven. In related phenomena, people who have had near-death experiences report the sensation of floating above their bodies, looking down on themselves and on others. And in some cases, these odd sensations aren't the result of a brush with death. People who report sleep paralysis or alien abduction have the feeling that their body and mind have parted ways. Could all these experiences have a common source? A neuroscientist explains what might be going on in the brain. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science Skeptic Check, after the hereafter. Big Picture Science is supported in part by Podiversity. Podiversity offers easy access to ad-free podcasts on Android devices. Your subscription to Podiversity helps support the production of Big Picture Science and your other favorite podcasts. Follow your favorite shows and have new episodes downloaded automatically to your Android device. You can download Podiversity from the link at bigpicturescience.org or at podiversity.com. When some people claim to have stepped to the other side, to have crossed the river Styx and taken a peek at the landscape, it usually comes about after a near-death experience, or NDE. In a near-death experience, the emphasis is on near. The heart stops, and during that time, the patient feels himself or herself floating up and out of the body. Some people see a tunnel or deceased family members or images of heaven, as we've heard. And it turns out that it's not a rare occurrence. In 2014, researchers at the University of Southampton made this startling finding that of the 2,000 individuals who had suffered cardiac arrest at 15 hospitals in the UK and survived, nearly 40% said that at the time of the medical crisis, they experienced an event, some awareness of what was going on around them, even though they were clinically dead. What can a near-death experience really tell us about life after death? And how might near-death experiences be related to other phenomena that are similarly described as out-of-body experiences, such as sleep paralysis or even alien abduction? Do these phenomena betray a vast and still unknown realm? Well, Yale neuroscientist Stephen Novella says, actually, there's a lot of scientific evidence that they are vivid and visceral illusions created by our brains during stress. It certainly seems like the kind of experience you would have if the brain was under extreme stress, uh, too much carbon dioxide, not enough oxygen, not enough blood flow, etc. We know that we can reproduce elements of these experiences with drugs. We can produce them with controlled situations like with airline pilots, fighter pilots or astronauts undergoing training, and we put them under extreme G-forces until they pass out. They have similar experiences quite often. So we know that the brain can produce these experiences under stress. Uh, and we're actually getting better at understanding 
why the brain generates these experiences to, to realize what parts of the brain are functioning and not functioning and how they make people feel, for example, that they're outside of their body or that they're one with the universe. Well, I can imagine that it's rather difficult to run experiments. I mean, you can't shove somebody into an fMRI machine to look at their brain and then give them a near-death experience because maybe it'll be a little bit better than near-death. Uh, it's kind of a hard thing, but you have some idea in any case of what's going on in the brain uh, or a dying brain or a brain that thinks it's dying. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, obviously we can't do the ultimate experiments, but we can infer uh, using uh, situations that are analogous in some way. So they're never perfect analogies of a near-death experience, but they give us uh, views of pieces of what's going on. So for example, there, there's a part of your brain that makes you feel as if you occupy your body, you're inside your body. And if we turn off that part of the brain, which we can do with drugs, or we could do that now with things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, we can use frequencies of magnetic waves that resonate with the neurons in the brain. And by using the right frequencies tuned to the right depth and location in the brain, we actually could either turn on, activate that part of the brain, or we could turn off that part of the brain and then see what happens. And if you, you know, turn off parts of the brain and people feel like they're floating outside their body. So when people in a near death experience remember a sensation of floating outside their body, well, maybe it's because that part of their brain was turning off because of the lack of oxygen. Well, that but seems like a at least a plausible explanation. But what would you say to someone who, you know, hears this from me and says, look, these aren't hallucinations. They've they've been to heaven or they've floated over the landscape or something. I mean, it certainly seems very real to them. How, how do you convince them otherwise? Or do you even bother? Well, so you have to be careful about what you're actually talking about. Often those kinds of stories, stories about, you know, being to heaven and details about flying on the wings of an angel or whatever, those are remembered often after a very long recovery. So now you have a memory that was formed sometime with a long period of somebody having pretty much every gradation of impaired brain function. Uh, they may have been in a complete coma for a while. And then as they're recovering, you don't just snap out of a coma. I mean, you have to, you might take hours, days, weeks for your brain to fully recover, during which you're confused and you're getting bits of information. You're in a dreamlike state. And then your brain struggles to make sense of these memory fragments it has, all these confused little bits of memory. So it weaves it all together in a narrative that's going to be consistent with your worldview and your beliefs and maybe things that people suggest to you. And then your memory of your memory alters over time. Every time you retell the story, your brain embellishes it. And this is not conscious lying. This is just how our memory works. So then six months later, a year later, by the time the person's writing a book or getting interviewed, they have this really compelling tale about being to heaven, who knows what, what those memories are from. The person may honestly believe that they have this consistent memory, but, you know, we can't count on that as an accurate experience, not at all. Well, if someone thinks that they've been to heaven and back, that might give them comfort, after all. I mean, you know, our mortal existence can certainly be bleak at times. And so, uh, you know, does it really matter if someone wants to believe that? I mean, is there any downside to that? Well, I, I usually don't care too much if people have comforting metaphysical beliefs. You know, we're all trying to survive, you know, get through this life. And if people find comfort in certain beliefs, you know, who am I to, uh, to deny that of them? But if they're making a scientific claim, if they're saying, ah, this is quote unquote proof of heaven, or we know that there's a heaven or that our souls survive our body because of these experiences, if they offer them as scientific evidence, then they're fair game. Then we could say, no, wait on, wait a minute, let's take an actual scientific look at this and try to interpret it in a logical way. I think the downside to it is just the promotion of scientific illiteracy, people not understanding what actually counts as scientific evidence and how it works. So as long as they're keeping it in the realm of personal belief, I actually don't care. I get involved when they, they're offering it as scientific evidence. What they might say is that, look, 
okay, maybe in the case of Alex Malarkey, he, he thought he had been to heaven, or at least a book was written in which he claimed that. Now he says, well, actually, he made that up. Okay, but that doesn't prove that heaven doesn't exist. It sounds like you're putting the burden of proof on the claimant. You know, extraordinary claims demand yeah. extraordinary evidence. It's, it's <laughs> almost like they, it's up the burdens on them to prove that their claim is true. Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously, I you know, I would never say that the malarkey case proves that there's, you can't prove a negative. You can't prove there's no heaven. You can't even prove that that means that all other people who claim they had a near-death experience are mistaken. Uh, it just means that he is not believable. He is now saying that he made it up. It is, I think, also evidence, and, and this shouldn't be overlooked, that people will make up fantastical, elaborate stories for their own complex psychological reasons. Often, believers will say, well, why would somebody lie? It's just too detailed or too compelling. How could somebody make up such an elaborate lie? Well, they can. They do it all the time. Here's an example. I think people underestimate all of the influences that people might be under when they eventually settle upon their near-death experience story that they tell. It certainly isn't a reliable or compelling form of evidence. You know, I'm just wondering now, what is the definition of a near-death experience? I mean, is it something that you can get close to, to, you know, to death? I mean, is there, you know, can you be near or farther from death? If you're alive, you're not dead, but can you be near? Yeah, I mean, the term is not really scientifically precise. We just use it to refer to situations in which somebody uh, is in either their heart stops or they're in a coma or they've undergone severe trauma. Sometimes they even offer up anesthesia cases during surgery as, uh, as cases. And that is the category of experiences that we're talking about. But the person doesn't have to actually have died. What sorts of sensations are reported in these near-death experiences? Well, the, the common elements, and there, there is a tremendous amount of variability. You know, often the sort of iconic story emerges in the popular consciousness, but that's not what a lot of the people are reporting. But there are some common elements, such as the sensation of floating outside one's body, uh, sometimes like the tunnel vision effect, often a sense of euphoria is not uncommon. The, the common elements just happen to be those that are the most reproducible in neurological situations like, you know, with the fighter pilots, for example, or on drug-induced or, or under experimental situations. And then people often fill in the details with a lot of culturally specific beliefs. So there's a core experience that is similar, and that's probably neurological. And then there are elements which are very culturally specific. So you interpret the experience according to your religious beliefs or your, your world view. Uh, people don't usually report smelling something or feeling something. It's more just visual and feelings. Well, that might give you a clue to which part of the brain is being, you know, kind of stressed, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, the, uh, neurological, you know, brain-based explanations account for everything can potentially. Obviously, we can't reverse engineer every last detail of what people experience, but uh yeah, it's very consistent with, you know, parts of the brain are working, parts of the brain are not working, and you get this really profound but confused type of experience. Uh, just like, you know, when people use psychedelic drugs, for example, and they feel like, you know, they're really big and they're merging with the universe and they're in the presence of God and all these kinds of weird things. It's a very profound experience uh, because we're not used to experiencing our own existence with only part of our brain working, uh, except for dreaming. I usually use dreaming as a good example. When you're dreaming, you're experiencing your existence and your brain is functioning in an altered state, a state that's different than when you're fully awake. And it's really weird. You know, we get used to it because we dream our whole lives. But with trying to remember your dream when you're awake, it's hard to make sense of it because you weren't thinking the way you think when you're awake, when you're dreaming. But so it's the same thing. Imagine trying to make literal sense of your dream as if it were an actual experience. That's sort of the same thing that people do. They, they try to make sense of their altered state that they're in as they're recovering from whatever trauma their brain was under. That I understand how profound the experience can be and that people would interpret it as best they can. They would think, hey, something really, really profound and metaphysical must have happened because I've never had an experience like this before. Uh, but if you understand how the brain works, it, it completely makes sense 
that, that the brain can completely generate that experience. It seems to be very commonplace. Uh, you probably are aware of this 2014 study by folks at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom that found that close to 40 percent of people who went into cardiac arrest and came back described some kind of awareness between the time they were, if you will, clinically dead and when their hearts were restarted. Uh, that doesn't sound so surprising in light of what you've said here. Yeah, but the problem with that kind of conclusion and stating it that way is they have a memory that they are uh, assigning to that period of time, but we don't know when those memories formed. Because, right, they could, those memories could have formed days later. There's no way to say the memories formed while their heart was stopped, mm. right? But, and, they, and, they, and there's a lot of reasons to think that they probably didn't. That, that's why you know, experiments have been done, a couple, where they tried to control for that variable. Say, is there any way that we can determine for sure that the memories were forming while the heart was stopped and the brain was really not functioning? And so they did things like put hidden cards with words on them too high to be seen from any place in the emergency room unless you were literally floating near the ceiling. The idea being that if somebody were actually floating up outside of their body, they could see the card. And no, no one's ever been able to see the card. So no one's been able to prove that the memories are actually forming at that time. And it's, it's very plausible that the memories are simply just forming later. And again, this is how they're making sense of it. I see. So the near-death experience uh, might have been just a complete blank, but something that happened a week later, uh, you know, was recalled as pertaining to that near-death experience. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Well, something that's a little bit like near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences is something called sleep paralysis. And sleep paralysis is often in the news in connection with alien abduction. A lot of people, a surprisingly large number of people, think that they may have been abducted by aliens. And uh, scientists will often say, you know what that was? Sleep paralysis. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's an interesting phenomenon and uh, one I'm interested not only as a neurologist, but I've had that experience myself multiple times. So I'm one of the 15% of the neurologically normal population, we'll assume I'm normal, that will have those experiences often during sleep deprivation. So I first started having them when I was a resident and would have to be on call and would be awake for 24, 30 hours at, at a stretch. And then whenever I would try to go to sleep after being very sleep deprived, I get this merger state between being awake and being asleep called this hypnagogic state or a waking dream. And again, it's, you're, it's an altered state. It's like your brain is not quite functioning as it normally does. Some common elements include a sense of a presence in the room with you, but you're paralyzed because that's a normal state. When you're dreaming, your brain paralyzes you so that you don't act out your dreams. That enhances the fear experience that you typically have. Uh, you may feel that there is a pressure on your chest, and some people interpret that as like a being sitting on their chest. So people have been having these ever since people have been writing down their experiences in the Middle Ages. People would have these experiences, and they would think that they were being visited by demons. Um, in Scandinavian cultures, they're being visited by the sea hag. You know, every culture kind of had their mythology around what kind of evil mythological creature was visiting you when you had these waking dreams or sleep paralysis. And now it's aliens because that's the, that's the current mythology, right? But it's the same experience uh, and it's clearly neurological. I mean, the, here there's really no question. Well, finally, Steve, it seems uh, that uh, most, if not all, of these very unusual experiences that take us to places that either we don't think we could ever go to or in, in a way that we couldn't get there, that these are just our brains creating an alternative reality. Our brains are pretty good at fooling us. Yeah, I mean, some uh, neuroscientists have commented that everything we experience, in a sense, is a hallucination or an illusion. Everything is a constructed experience. Even your normal waking existence, your brain is constructing this completely artificial experience, making up stuff, selecting what sensations to pay attention to, making it all fit with your internal narrative. But then you throw things off even a little bit and it can produce experiences that are just as constructed, but they're incredibly flawed or they're missing key elements like feeling like you're inside your body. 
and those produce very unusual experiences. So in a way, you're correct, but I would say that everything we experience is a deception on some level or another. Steve Novella, I was going to say it's been real, but in any, <laughs> case, but in any case, I want to thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure, Seth. Thanks for having me. Steve Novella is a professor of neurology at Yale University School of Medicine and host of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. And as we've heard in this show, the claims for the hereafter simply don't meet the standards of science. Although we did hear from Dr. Garrett that the question of whether or not heaven exists is important because it may guide how we live our life. And we also asked if there could be another explanation for these phenomena. And Steve Novella tells us, you know, our brains create our reality. And it seems that sometimes they're more creative than at others. Well, thanks to the down-to-earth talent that helped produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David and the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to our monthly look at critical thinking, Skeptic Check. This episode, After the Hereafter. If you'd like to hear more Skeptic Check or other Big Picture Science episodes, you'll find them in our archive on our website, bigpicturescience.org. If you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because there's always more programming coming on after, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station's not on that list, well, consider letting them know that you like this show. Oh, and if you have a comment, a criticism, a suggestion, maybe some faint praise, email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.